Uh, thanks, I'm Arthur Pearson, and uh, first and foremost, I wanted to say thanks to all of you for being here this evening in support of the Natural Land Institute. Protecting our natural lands was an incredibly hard job when George founded NLI back in 1958, and I think it goes without saying in light of current circumstances, it remains an incredibly hard job today. Your support is more important than ever. Is George would have been compelled to remind us, and yes, I am a little taken with George, um, but in fact, as George does remind us, for his is a living legacy. There remains more work to be done, more boundaries to push, and George was always pushing boundaries, and when necessary, more cages to rattle, sometimes to get the job done. So I feel fortunate to be able to help protect our natural lands in a few different ways. I have been a long-term volunteer steward, so congratulations again to all the volunteer stewards. I met several signing the books. Volunteers really make the world go round, and I feel fortunate to do that. At Medewa National Tallgrass Prairie, some of you might know it's the former Joliet Arsenal. And once it's 19,000 acres are fully restored, it will, be, it will be by an order of magnitude the largest tallgrass prairie east of the Mississippi River. I'm also fortunate to be able to work for the Gaylord Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, where among my responsibilities, I get to help guide the foundation's investments to protect and restore natural land throughout the Chicago wilderness region. And I like to think, anyways, that my writing helps out a little bit too. I've written about a lot of different issues, from gypsy moths to emerald ash borers, for a lot of different publications, a lot of nonprofit organizations, including the Natural Land Institute. And now I've written this book. Um, and I'm so grateful that Jerry Paulson, yes, it is your fault, I'm holding you personally responsible. Um, I'm so grateful that, lo, those many years ago, you contacted me to write about George. When Jerry contacted me, I'd been writing about conservation for a while, and what struck me is I'd never heard of George. Hadn't a clue, and as I would come to find out, that wasn't all that unusual. So I was really intrigued, just who was this guy? So I recall my first visit to NLI to get started, and Jerry and Jill Kinney, and Jill, a special shout out to you, really, for, <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold, so I've got to, <clears throat> every once in a while, clear my throat. But thank you for all of the kind help and support you provided over the years, and especially your incredible support for Barbara, especially during her final years. A special shout out to you for your kind care and attention for Barbara, so thank you. <clears throat> Newly married, and I would ask to like I would like to ask my wife if she bring me a little bit of water, that would really be helpful. Two months in and still we're working together well on this. Thank you. Okay, that's better. All right. Um, so my first visit to NLI and I walked into the NLI offices and Jerry and Jill had set up, I don't know, maybe 10 or so bankers boxes filled with information of George's. And it wasn't sorted, it wasn't indexed, it was just 10 really full boxes of information. It's like, okay, I got a little reading to do, no problem. But Jerry said, but before we get started, let's go up to the second floor. I think there's some more information up there. <laughs> and if you've ever been to the NLI offices, that big, beautiful, historic home that I would come to learn George had restored himself being a jack of all trades, if not a master of all trades. Um, Jerry opened up this big, massive walk-in closet, and honestly, floor to ceiling, there's boxes of yet more information. Okay. And Jerry says, well, let's go down to the basement. <laughs> we go down to the basement, there's a big room with bookshelves lining the walls, filled with books and journals and volumes that George had collected really over a lifetime. And next to that, there was a small room with these two massive antiquated printing presses. And again, as I would come to learn, George had acquired those during the early years of the Nature Conservancy to save money, number one, because George is always about saving money. And he hand printed all of the initial Nature Conservancy materials, membership solicitations, brochures, newsletters, including the forerunner of what today is the Nature Conservancy magazine. And next to these presses were boxes to get more information, and I'm sure I turned to Jerry at that point somewhat ashen-faced, wondering just what I got myself into. And in spite of our strong shared Swedish heritage, Jerry took no mercy on me and said, by the way, I think Barbara, a few doors down, has yet more information. And anyone who visited the Fells over the years knows that, in fact, the Fells did have a few more things packed into the three-story home. <clears throat> so, 
So eventually, at the initial phase of, um, when I completed the initial phase of writing the research, um, all of George's uh, materials were donated by NLI to George's undergraduate alma mater, the University of Illinois, also my undergraduate alma mater, and they're now available and accessible to the archive there. And the total volume of material equals 69.1 cubic feet. That's archive speak for 71 boxes of information, exclusive of all those books and journals. That was just the papers and stuff. On top of that, I conducted a lot of interviews with George's friends and relatives and colleagues. And all of that, I initially distilled into a concise 25 pages. The high points were really of an exceptional life and exceptional career. For inclusion in NLI's 50th anniversary publication, A Legacy of Natural Lands. And I'm sure that there are some of you in the room this evening who helped contribute to that first publication. I want to say thank you. I think it's a handsome publication. I think it's an important publication. But 71 boxes. I knew there was a lot more of a story that in fact needed to be told. So much more richness and complexity and nuance in the many efforts in which George was involved. So much more richness and complexity and nuance too in the man himself. And more than that, it's precisely the interplay between the two, who George was and what he accomplished, that's where the real story is. Because in fact, they're inseparable. So how was it, after all, that a lonely kid who grew up on the wrong side of the river in Rockford, as he put it, who was at best throughout his academic years only an average student, he wasn't a standout by any means, who then suffered through the stigma of being a conscientious objector to World War II, in defiance of a father who was both a gifted botanist and a prominent military figure in both world wars, who then was newly married and then newly fired from his first and really the only job he ever held outside of any of the organizations that he founded. So how was it that this guy, no job, no money, no experience to speak of, went on to found what is today the largest conservation organization in the world? and launched an entire movement dedicated to protecting natural lands. So, as I hope you'll agree, as a man and a conservationist, George is deserving of a full-length biography, and I feel so immensely gratified that the University of Wisconsin Press has published it. They're notable for publishing biographies of notable conservation leaders, including Aldo Leopold and John Muir, but I think there was a gap on their shelf, and I think that gap has now been subsequently filled by this biography, because George is that important, and George deserves to be spoken in that same company. <clears throat> it's been a tremendous privilege working on this book for the past, past 15 years, but I do have a single regret. It's that Barbara Fell is not here to enjoy this moment with us tonight. As I point out in the introduction to the book, in many ways, Barbara was incredibly generous with me. She hosted me in her home. She cooked me meals which I survived. <laughs> so this next part isn't in the book, but I thought those of you who know, it might I know her might appreciate it. At some point, I just gave up looking at the expiration dates on the cans of Campbell's cream of mushroom soup that she mined from the dark recesses of her cupboard. I just went with it, I'm alive, it's all good. <laughs> Barbara also walked preserves with me that she and her husband had protected spent many hours talking to me about her husband, and she had an incredibly sharp mind and an unforgiving mind for details. But Barbara also had a protective and a very particular take on how she wanted her husband's story to be told, perfectly understandable. Imagine, if you will, if a relative stranger came into any of our homes and started asking a lot of questions and writing down this information, about your spouse, or about a parent, or about a child, I suspect most of us would feel similarly protective and wanting to shape and even control the narrative. So I get where Barbara's coming from. But among the challenges of writing a biography about anyone is that, in truth, each one of us is a multifaceted jewel. Admittedly, without a doubt, Barbara knew things about George far better than I ever could. I know that some of you in this room know yet more things about George better than me. But my challenge, my responsibility as a biographer was to embrace all of these and many other and diverse and sometimes conflicting facets and discover among them a narrative thread that unifies and ties them all together. So one of the things, for instance, that, Barbara made, that made Barbara feel uncomfortable was something so fundamental as her own role in her husband's work. 
I can't take credit for anything Barbara must have told me at least a thousand times. George was the genius. He would have done it all with or without me. I think some of you might have heard her say that once or 11 times. <clears throat> so, and now I'd like to, if I may, just write a, read a brief piece from the book in the introduction. In spite of Barbara's protestations, the well-documented record is clear that she had more than a little to do with her husband's success. As breadwinner, as volunteer and paid staff member, as editor, membership coordinator, and general factotum, as advocate and defender, as confidant, companion, and devoted spouse for 46 years, Barbara was her husband's equal in passion, commitment, and tenacity when it came to advancing the cause of natural areas preservation. Therefore, it gives me great pleasure to acknowledge her own rightful place in conservation history by dedicating this book to her memory. I need to give <laughs> And so on to George. So one of the things I really enjoyed about talking to lots of folks is that how few people really knew the full breadth of what George had accomplished or who he was as a person. So, how many here know that George was an absolute genius when it came to investing in the stock market? A couple? Yeah. So, George's brother-in-law, Ned Garst, that was Barbara's brother, and a founding board member of NLI, which he served for many years, for about 30 plus years, I want to say, um, he had this to say about George's investment prowess. I went to Harvard Business School, but I could have taken investment lessons from George. So, why this is important is throughout George's career, he never earned much money. For many years, in fact, Barbara was the sole wage earner, allowing George to devote himself full-time to his natural areas efforts. And then even the little compensation that George did eventually earn, he plowed much of it directly back into the Natural Land Institute, the Nature Preserves Commission, and astonishingly, making good on loan payments on behalf of the state of, the, of Illinois when the state didn't have cash or was delayed in making payments for land acquisition. So, the Fells were able to do this in part because George had as sharp an eye for investment opportunities as he did for strategic land acquisitions. And again, why do I mention this? Because, and I appreciated the graph that you had up there about the impressive growth of NLI. George would have loved that, and I'm sure he's applauding from someplace. Um, but talking about George's prowess as an investor, it helps explain an article that George wrote summarizing the history of the natural areas movement. So George had always intended to write a full history of the movement. In fact, the day that he and Barbara got married, they started keeping a journal dedicated to their natural areas efforts. But unfortunately, illness cut short George's life and he never got around to it, but in 1988, he did, in fact, write a summary history in an article for the Natural Areas Journal. And in this article, he devotes fully half of it to a detailed analysis comparing IBM to TNC, International Business Machines to the Nature Conservancy, or as he put it, Big Blue versus Big Oak Leaf. So, as only George, I think, would have conceived it, in the article, he referenced a series of logarithmic graphs that he had plotted, <coughs> revealing that over the lifespan of TNC at that point, which is about 40 years, IBM's accumulated earnings with dividends reinvested had grown at an annual rate of 18.5%. Pretty impressive. Who here is getting 18.5% today? Not too many of us. So then referencing another set of graphs, you reveal that TNC during that same time period, its growth had been far more impressive in the total number of members, the number of conservation projects, the total acres protected, total operating revenues, and total fund balances. So again, just the kind of stuff that was shown before. George would have loved that. So even then, in 1988, TNC was well on its way to becoming, as I have mentioned previously, the largest conservation organization in the world. But to read George's article, you'd never know that he had a thing to do with it. Typical George. In fact, in the article, he went out of his way to downplay the importance of the institutions that he had built, going so far as to say that the success of the natural areas movement was due entirely, in his words, to the determined efforts of a growing band of dedicated believers. So this is something, too, you learn as a biographer, that even the subject of a biography can at times be unreliable as a source. 
So the fact is that prior to George coming along, there were few mechanisms for protecting lands outside of national parks and state forests and the like. And what few mechanisms did exist were largely piecemeal, uncoordinated, and ultimately insufficient to protect the full spectrum of our biological heritage, which was under huge threat in the building boom, excuse me, building boom following World War II. Prior to George coming along, a lot of incredibly smart people had talked for a long time about the need for a better way to protect our natural area remnants. It was George who stepped up and got it done. At the national level with the Nature Conservancy, at the state level with the Nature Preserves Commission, at the local regional level with the Natural, Lands, natural Land Institute. He sometimes did this graciously, he sometimes, as many colleagues, termed it politely by being a real bulldog. But it was George who came up with systemic solutions, and that's really the key thing. No more piecemeal, no more haphazard, no reactionary. Systemic, proactive solutions. He's the one who provided the form and structure that, in fact, proved necessary to galvanize that band of dedicated believers, both then and now. George saved a lot of land. By my calculation, he saved more land as an individual than any other person in the state of Illinois. But his greatest legacy are the mechanisms he left in place, and those and the many more that were sparked and inspired by his efforts. <coughs> so NOI remains a key part of this living legacy that continues to inspire and galvanize us today of this and future generations to take up the cause of protecting the native plants and animals that we love. Let me get a quick drink. I'm on the last page. <laughs> so it seems fitting that George should get the final word here. And to be honest, George was not a good writer. He was fairly dry. He was fairly pedantic. He was often derivative. But every once in a while, a little bit of George would emerge and reveal the heart and soul of the man. So speaking of conservation, it's the cause that we have. I'm going to try to get through this without being emotional, because Carrie's right. I'm really taken by George, and <clears throat> he moves me deeply for his passion, so I'm going to try to get through this, so bear with me. <clears throat> How many people have a cause of any kind, a purpose in life? What nobler, almost, <clears throat> what nobler cause can there possibly be? What we do as conservationists is important and selfless is feeding the hungry healing the sick, teaching, and helping people in other ways. To us, our work is among the most basic of charities. We fight a difficult and frustrating battle with tragic losses, but we are making great accomplishments. What other cause can claim more? Thank you again for the work that you do. I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you for having me here this evening.